Right, good morning everyone. So, as you will notice, here we are, back in school, back in the 4DW classroom, which is really exciting. I can't wait till all you guys are back here as well um, to join me in the classroom. That's going to be really, really cool. This has been a really strange time, hasn't it? So today we are going to start by reading um, David Walliams' Slime. This is our new book that we are starting today. So give you a quick recap. We looked at it a little bit yesterday. It said on the back, to say Ned was just an ordinary boy would be wrong. He wasn't ordinary. He was extraordinary. So take a look at that front cover. Hmm, what could this book be about? Let's find out. Right, let's find it. Oh, remember in The Ice Monster, there was a really good... Um, it was a really good introduction, wasn't there? Let's introduce us to the characters. Doesn't look like there is in this one. Right. This story is set on the Isle of Mulch. The little island is home to some big characters. He is going to introduce the characters first. So this is Ned. Ned is a bright and funny boy of 11. Because his legs haven't worked since he was a baby, Ned, Ned uses a wheelchair to whiz around mulch. This is Jemima, and Jemima is Ned's older sister. Jemima likes nothing more <clears throat> than playing the most horrid tricks on her little brother. These are Ned's parents. So Ned's parents, dad spends all day on his fishing boat out at sea, and mum spends all day at the island's market selling the fish that he catches. Cool. This is Sir Walter Rath. And Sir Walter Rath is the headmaster of Ned's old school, Mulch School for Revolting Children. It is the boys' old school because Sir Walter expelled Ned in one of his notorious volcanic rages. Interesting. And um, this is Mr. Lust. Mr. Lust is the deputy head of Mulch School for Revolting Children. Day and night, he lusts after the top job, that of headmaster. This is Edmund and Edmond Envy. And they run the only toy shop on the island named Envy's Emporium. The terrible twins loathe children for the simple crime of being young and send the poor mites fleeing from their shop in floods of tears. They don't sound like good uh, shop owners, do they? Um, this is Madame Silenzio Sloth. What a name. And she is the world's laziest piano teacher. The lady is paid good money to give piano lessons to children. However, all she does is snooze on the sofa as she blows off thunderously. <laughs> this is Captain Pride. And Captain Pride is the island's park keeper. The public park is the ex-army officer's pride and joy, so much so that absolutely no one is ever allowed to set foot inside it, especially not nasty little children who will trample his precious glass, grass. This is Glenn and Glenda Glutton, and they own the only ice cream van on the island, Glutton's Glaciers. That is because they have rammed all their rival ice cream vans off the road. The married couple are thieves who snatch children's pocket money and then speed off without giving them their ice creams. Instead, the evil pair scoff all the ice creams themselves. Oh, no, everyone on this island sounds really selfish, don't they? This is Aunt Greta Greed, and this is um, Ned and Jemima's mega-rich auntie. She owns the Isle of Mulch. The, gold, the grand old lady lives alone in a castle high on the hill that overlooks the entire island. All she has to keep her company are more than 100 cats, all called Tiddles. Gigantic Tiddles is Aunt Greta's heftiest cat. She is the size and weight of a bear and infinitely more fearsome. And last but not least, this is Slime. And slime is very much alive. It is a creature with powers to change shape or trans slime into anything and everything. But is slime a force for good or for evil? It says we must read on. 
And this is Raj, the news agent, which does not live on mulch. Um, and he says, that's a shame. Who's looking forward to being in the story? Do you remember Raj from, um, from the Ice Monster? Raj was in the Ice Monster as well. So this is the prologue, a brief story of slime. Slime is one of the greatest mysteries of all the world, if not the greatest. It beats the creation of Stonehenge, laughs in the face of the power of the pyramids, and takes a slimy plop on the Loch Ness Monster. Slime, what is it? Where is it? Who is it? How is it? And why is it? Children demand to know where slime came from, and grown-ups are desperate to know if it is ever going back. For the first time in history, the legend of slime can finally be told. All will be revealed in this book, which might be the most important book ever written. And this is a written, we know is not a real word. It says, a real word, world, word you will find in your William Sictionary, the world's number one dictionary. William Sictionary. There is another theory, <clears throat> excuse me, there is another theory that many years ago, slime-based aliens from a slime-based planet, the planet Slime, flew in a slime-based spaceship to the Earth. Once on Earth, they taught ancient civilizations all about slime, how to construct buildings out of slime, the best recipes to cook with slime, and most importantly, how to make socks out of slime. <clears throat> Then the slime-based aliens got in their slime-based spaceship and whizzed back to their slime-based planet, the planet Slime. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they never, ever came again. But they left the secrets of slime with the human race so children could torment grown-ups with it forever. The truth is rather different. Slime was actually created more than 50 years ago on a remote island, the island of Mulch, to be precise. It is situated in the great north southwestern, northeast southwestern sea <clears throat> between the islands of Twaddle and Stench. How do I know all this? <clears throat> because I just made it up. So this is a map of the Isle of Mulch, which I will try and show you so you can see. Have a good look around. <clears throat> Lots of things on there. Okay. Chapter one, Mulch. The little Isle of Mulch was home to less than a thousand people, 999 to be precise. I told you it was less than a thousand. One of these 999 people was a boy named Ned. Ned wasn't short for anything. He was just called Ned. Ned was 11 years old. He'd been born on mulch, and like most islanders, he had never left. Needless to say, both Ned's parents absolutely stank of fish. But Ned didn't see or even smell much of them as the pair were always working. Instead, the boy was left home alone with his older sister. Jemima resented Ned deeply. She might have been the older one, but it was her younger brother who got all the attention. The girl wore pretty flowery dresses with huge steel-capped boots, and she was not afraid to use them. Ned's aunt owned the Isle of Mulch. She was his grand, she was his mother's much older sister, and her name was Greta Greed. High on a hill overlooking the whole island squatted Kitty Litter Castle, a huge medieval fortress that the lady called home. It was a world away from the tiny cottage that Ned shared with his family. Greed lived there alone, which is how she liked it. Her only company was 101 cats. These cats were fearsome beasts. She had them to scare nasty little children away. The lady loathed children, especially her poor nephew, Ned. Aunt Greta never ever did a thing to help him. For her, children real ruined her Isle of Mulch with their games, their chatter, and worst of all, their stench. 
Aunt Greta should be the last person to complain about a smell because she stank of cat pee. Because Aunt Greta owned the entire island, she had power over all those who lived there. The lady rewarded those grown-ups on mulch who detested children almost as much as she did. One such man was Sir Walter Rath. He was a nasty old wretch whom Green had, Greed had made headmaster of the only school on the island, mulch school for revolting children. The only thing that gave Rath pleasure was expelling children from his school. Like so many others, Ned had suffered that fate. There was only one toy shop on the island. Greed had given care of it to twin brothers, Edmund and Edmund, Edmund and Edmond Envy, and had named the shop Envy's Emporium. Here's some pictures of those guys. But it was nothing more than a front for terrorising children. Ned had had a particularly nasty time when he had last visited. Another resident of Mulch was Madame Silenzio Sloth. The lady was supposed to be a piano teacher, but she was too lazy to teach children anything. Sloth was a virtuoso of cruelty. Ned had the misfortune of being one of her pupils, and when he dared to complain, all hell broke loose. Captain Pride was an uptight ex-soldier who Greed had appointed Mulch's park keeper. The captain ensured no one could ever enjoy the island's only public park, especially not people like Ned. Then there were the ice cream sellers, Gled and Glenda Glutton. They made sure children never got to enjoy the ice cream, ever. The married couple zoomed around the island in their van, looking for children to rob. They took their pocket money and then sped off without giving them their ice cream. If the Gluttons had lived anywhere else in the world other than Mulch, they would have been locked up in prison and the key thrown away. However, Greed delighted in their scam and ensured the pair were never brought to justice, even when they stole from her own nephew, Ned. So, this little island was home to a large number of horrible grown-ups, but there was a child on the island who was probably as bad. Poor Ned was related to her. It was his sister. Chapter 2. A Beastly Girl Ned's sister, Jemima, liked nothing more than playing horrid tricks on her little brother. Tricks that made the girl snigger to herself all day and night. It wasn't a nice snigger, it was a nasty snigger, as if she knew she was beastly. The tricks were all absolutely fouls. A foul, dropping wiggly-waggly worms down the back of her little brother's pyjamas. Yikes! Replacing Ned's toothpaste with glue so his, ste his teeth stuck together. Mm. Emptying a jar of his favourite marmalade and replacing it with mashed up wasps. Ugh. Painting everything in her little brother's room bright purple. The walls, the floor, the ceiling, his toys and his clothes and even his pet gerbil. No! Hiding a big furry spider at the end of his bed so it nibbled his toes. Ah! Dusting the toilet seat with chilli powder so the boy's body was too, too hotty. Swapping Ned's favourite chocolate-covered raisins with gerbil droppings. Ugh! And breaking wind into an old wooden box for a week and then open it in Ned's bedroom so he would suffer the pong pongtasmagoria, uh, which is apparently another real word you will find with ease in your Wallium dictionary. Ooh, that sounds smelly. However, this was nothing compared to the nightmarish trick Jemima was planning for her little brother. Chapter 3. Gunk. Jemima was a child who reveled in all things yucky. Not just spiders and worms, but gooey things too. All around the little cottage where the family lived, the girl had hidden gunk in jars. Things you found under rocks, things you found at the bottom of ponds, things you found lurking down the plug hole. Jemima would scoop up anything nasty and deposit it into a jar. Over time, she had collected hundreds and hundreds of jars of all different kinds of gunk. Every single one had a label on it, so Jemima would remember what was what. One shudders to think how the girl collected some of these revolting things. You would not want to touch this stuff with your bare hands. So, these are all the jars of gunk. 
which include Badger Snot, Frog Spawn, Slippery Sludge, Granny Dribble, Snail Trail, Jellyfish, Foot Cheese, Pigeon Poop, Rotten Eggs, Toenail Grot, Underarm Sweat, Old Man's Flen, Off Custard, Furballs, Stinging Nettle Juice, Liquidized Worms, that weird yellow stuff that ladybirds leave on your finger, gerbil wee, earwax, wet bottom burps, belly button fluff, crushed caterpillars, spider sick, very mouldy mould, slug juice, bat eggs, and something unspeakable that cannot be named. At the bottom of every wardrobe, at the back of every cupboard, under the floorboards, there were jars and jars and more jars. Jemima was stockpiling them in the family cottage as she wanted to play the most humongous trick on her little brother. A trick that would make him scream the house down. Oh! A scream that would echo all over the Isle of Mulch forever. Jemima would snigger herself to sleep thinking about her devilish plan. There was just one problem. Her little brother was on to her. Chapter 4. Bogies under the bed. Ned found the jars. Just one jar at first, in a deep sleep. Ned had rolled off his bed in the dead of night. Thud! Ouch! The fall had woken him up. Just as he was about to haul himself back up, Ned noticed something glinting in the darkness under his bed. He reached out and found it was a jar. The label in his sister's scrawled handwriting read simply, bogies. On closer inspection, he discovered it really was a jar bursting with bogies. They looked very much like Jemima's. She had picked, licked and flicked so many at Ned over the years that he could recognise them in any lineup instantly. Hers were always a brownish shade of green. At once, Ned knew his wicked sister was up to something. But why had she hidden her own bogies in a jar under his bed? Lifting up the sheets, he saw that this was just one of what must have been a hundred jars under there, each containing something more disgusting than the last. Ned's eyes bulged as he read the labels. Ground ants, boiled dandruff, yellow pus, brown pus, yellowy brown pus, browny yellow pus. Sludge found in the plug, plug, plug hole after a bath, cheesy burps, slobber, meaty burps, wart soup, monkey sweat, burpy burps, spicy burps, toad juice, ten-year-old trifle that has gone so fizzy it will blow your head off, pudding, puddle gunge or punge, and something even more unspeakable than the other unspeakable thing that cannot ever be named. One by one, Ned pulled all the jars out from under his bed. He was careful not to clink them together. The sound would wake up his wicked sister, who was sleeping in her room next door. Then, Ned hoisted himself up onto his battered old wheelchair so he could go hunting for more jars. One good thing about getting around on wheels is that you can glide silently and undetected, as long as you don't bump into furniture. Donk! Or run over a cat. Meow! Ned rolled past his sister's bedroom and headed into the living room. Now, thought Ned, where would be a good hiding place? It turned out, everywhere. There were jars, jars and more jars of yucktastic stuff hidden all over the bedroom. And it says, don't delay, buy your Wallian dictionary today. Because yucktastic is not a proper word, is it? It's a David Wallian's word. It's a cool word, though. I like it. So the places they were hidden were behind the curtains, under the sofa, on the bookshelf, in the sideboard, under the cushions, behind a plant pot, un inside the lampshade, and underneath the coffee table. The same was true of the kitchen and the hallway. Rolling past the boiler cupboard, Ned heard gurgling. Gurgle, furgle, devil. He opened the door and could see jars and jars with gunk oozing out of them. The heat from the boiler must have made the gunk expand. It was a wonder that one of the jars hadn't exploded. Once again, all the jars were labelled, each full of something more puzzling than the last. 
What was all this stuff? Plume, grunge, spludge, fugal, muppety, wink your dink, honey no 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 no, funk, 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 boo boo, noodle, woolly bumps, dunty punt, snud, miggle, piffle paffle, zonty wanty woo wah, plutz plutz, and binda booly. And more importantly, what was she planning to do with it all? Wow, that was fun. So, what is Ned's sister going to do with all of that? That's really crazy. Right, hope you guys enjoyed the first part of our book, Slime. We will carry on reading that tomorrow and see what happens. So, I will now be in school every Monday morning and Thursday afternoon. Okay, so... That means that I will be marking any work you've done at home. If you need any feedback on your work, I can give you that feedback at, at work. Um, and I can get start getting things ready for you if you need anything at home as well. I am also going to be ringing you all this week, okay? which I'm really looking forward to seeing how you guys are getting on. So please let me know if you need anything. If you, if you have a th little think now between I will either ring you today or if I don't get time to ring everyone today, I will ring you on Thursday. So have a little think about um, anything that you might need. And then when we speak, um, you'll be able to tell me what it is that you need. OK, guys, I'm so excited to be back in school. It's really great. And we're doing lots of work here so that we can um, so that we're ready for when we all have to come back to school. OK, so take care, guys. Um, stay safe and I will speak to you all very soon. OK, bye.